Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our text recorded in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. In Jesus' name, amen. Love and respect, respect and love, the two pillars upon which a Christian marriage is built, easier said than done. So to help out a bit, I'm bringing in two of my friends, Johnny and Chachi, through a video called Killer Marriage Tips. Killer Marriage Tips. Hi, I'm Dr. Gary Smalley, and I've been helping marriages for years improve, and I've got a couple of friends who have some very unique insights into marriage, and I want you to meet them. Hey, thank you, Gary. My name is Johnny, and I'm Chachi. And you know, marriage is something I think we're all excited about. It's something that we think we can bring a lot of wisdom to. Isn't that right, Dr. Dobson? Uh, Smalley. Oh, oh, that, that's our faux pas. We got some killer marriage tips we think they're really going to knock your socks off. Yeah. So let's do some dance and get this party started and help marriages out all over the country. Let's no, no, let's go ahead and just roll with the tips. No dance. <laughs> When you get the chance, finish your wife's sentences for her. It's important that she knows that you know where she's going with a particular thought or sentence. Yeah, this says, I know you, I love you, and you're predictable, but in a good way. When on vacation, have fun. But make sure your wife knows exactly how much this thing is costing. Now remember, allowing her to feel guilt can actually be a good thing. Right you are, because guilt is actually an acronym for Good Financial Stewardship. No. It's it is. When you're in an argument, it's key to use the time that your spouse is talking to come up with what you want to say next. So it goes like this. You speak. And then while she's speaking, you think, and then you speak again. And that's how the killer comebacks happen. Surprise your wife with a weekend trip for you and your buddies. Sure, how many weekend? Yeah, okay. Husbands, doing this will help her see that you're taking care of your needs. And taking care of your needs will give you the ability to take care of her needs. You know, putting your kids in timeout works for most parents, but putting your spouse in timeout can also be really effective. Putting your spouse in a timeout chair will hopefully help her see things from a different perspective, preferably yours. And if you get any pushback, I'd let her know that you're having a hard time telling her apart from the children. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever your wife tells you about something she wants to buy, respond with the sound effect of a cash register. Here's a little role play for you. Hey, honey, I'm going to go buy some skinny jeans. Cha-ching. <laughs> hey, honey, I'm going to go get some bread now. Cha-ching. <laughs> you know, guys, uh, those are kind of horrible tips. Okay. I mean, when you think about it, uh, those were killer tips, and I think they'd, like, kill most marriages. Well, I guess we're at an impasse now. Awkward. Hey, Gary, here's an idea, though. To keep the video rolling, let's just do the robot at the end and send this thing off with some fun, if you know what I'm saying. You want to do that with us? I, I, I tell you what, I was, you know, uh, a little bit uncomfortable by this. It's kind of, like, weird. Now, uh, some of my boys in confirmation class are very concrete thinkers. So boys, just do the opposite of everything there, okay? And you might survive. But you know, when we look at uh, marriage advice that's out there in the world, men's and women's magazines, talk shows, the net, even some of the helpful tips that we might get from friends and family on marriage, honestly, is it that far from Johnny and Chachi's? Bad advice? Why? 
Because what we hear today about marriage is simply this. Self. Do whatever you need to protect yourself. Do whatever you need to take care of yourself. Take care of self, and if your marriage works out, you know, that's great. But if not, then at least you've got what? Yourself. Yeah, you've taken care of self. So there's got to be some better advice out there. But here's the problem. When we turn to God's word, well, when we look at the advice that the Bible gives about marriage, women submit. Husbands love. Ugh. How does that work? Is it even relevant for today? Yeah, I don't think we're always that happy about what the Bible says about how to have a happy marriage. Ephesians 5, 22 and verse 25. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Submission and sacrifice. Sacrifice and submission. Love and respect, respect and love. Is that really God's view of what a marriage should be? Well, there's one more thing. One more verse before we dive into this passage from Ephesians more thoroughly. Ephesians 5.32. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Here in the last half of the fifth chapter of Ephesians, what is Paul really talking about? Is he even talking about marriage? Or is he really talking about something else? The church. The relationship between Jesus and his church on earth. The church, you and I, the bride of Christ. Both, actually. What Paul is saying is that in a Christian marriage, we have been given a snapshot, a picture of what God intends our life to be with him here on earth. That is an image of the church on earth. Jesus, the bridegroom. We, the church, the bride. We, the church, submitting ourselves to him. And he, Jesus, the groom, sacrificing himself for us. Submission and sacrifice. Respect and love. Indeed, no greater love than this. And it's all wrapped around the idea of what a Christian marriage can be. So let's get back to some basics. This past summer, as you might recall, we journeyed through the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And in those first three chapters, the first three chapters of the Bible, we discovered some fundamentally important things about marriage. First, that Adam, man, was created first. That there is an order and a purpose to the creation of men and women. It's not just simply random natural selection. But more importantly... In a world where everything was created good, that it was not good for man to be alone. Genesis 2.18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man, Adam, should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. The helper, Neged Ezer, that Hebrew, was a perfect fit for Adam. Indeed, Eve, woman, this Negev Ezer, this fit helper, created from Adam's own flesh, his own rib. The word we use for this concept is complementarianism, a word coined about 25 years ago to help set a course through this rapidly changing culture and rapidly changing views about men and women. Wikipedia's definition isn't bad. I tweaked it a little bit. Complementarianism is a theological view in Christianity that men and women have different but complementary roles and responsibilities in marriage, family life, religious leadership, and elsewhere. Mary Cassian, and yes, I picked a female author, Mary Cassian, writing for the Gospel Coalition, goes on to explain why this is important. Complementarians believe that God created male and female as 
complementary expressions of the image of God. Male and female are counterparts in reflecting his glory. Having two sexes expands the view. Though both sexes bear God's image fully on their own, each does so in a unique and distinct way. Male and female in relationship reflects truths about Jesus that aren't reflected by male alone or female alone. Thus, biblical Christianity celebrates the distinct differences that come with God's creation of two very different sexes. Now today, there is much, much talk that makes this fundamental human difference sound like it's somehow bad or somehow evil. And with it, we keep hearing this strange idea that man has the ability to choose his own understanding of gender and even to redefine what it means to be male and female. Folks, God did not make a mistake. In the beginning, he created them male and female and then declared both very, very good. Now notice here one other thing, that complementarianism says nothing regarding equality or inequality. Complementarianism simply points out a basic human truth that people have recognized for as long as there has been people, that is, up until about a decade or two ago. And the truth is this. Men are different than women. True? Women are different than men. And once again, God intended it that way. And that's a very, very good thing. Indeed, Genesis goes on to emphasize the beauty and the equality of all human beings in two more verses. These are the original wedding texts, if you will. Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then Genesis 2, 23. Then the man said... This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Both male and female, man and woman, husband and wife, created in the image of God. Now, do these verses get abused? Do these verses, along with the ones that we are looking at Ephesians, get used to say things about man's superiority, you know, man was created first and all the rest that goes with that. Oh, absolutely. There's always theologians out there like Johnny and Chachi, you know, guys who are looking to make the Bible say what they want it to say rather than what it actually says. Indeed, the problem with Ephesians chapter 5 isn't Ephesians chapter 5. It's when this text, women submit to men, men are head over women, it's when this text gets used as a club, as a weapon, as a tool that insecure men use to put women in their place. Folks, God's already put women right where he wanted them to be. And a wife's place is right beside her husband. The biblical commentator Matthew Henry in the 1700s, think about that, 1700s, 200 years ago said this, Eve was not taken out of Adam's head to top him, neither out of his feet to be trampled on by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected by him, and near his heart to be loved by him. Okay, so then why does Paul say this here in Ephesians chapter 5? Why does Paul want women to submit to their husbands? Because it's the most Christ-like thing that a woman can do. And then why does Paul tell husbands to love their wives? I mean, isn't that kind of self-evident? Indeed, to love their wives even more 
than they love their own bodies. Or to say it another way, to love their wives even more than they love themselves. Because it is the most Christ-like thing for a man to do. Submission for women, sacrifice for men. What Paul is doing here is challenging us in the very ways that are the hardest ways that we can be challenged. He hits us in the nerve center. The very things that we are most defensive about. The very actions and behaviors that we have the hardest time giving up, giving into. Let's take a closer look. Ephesians 5, 22 through 24. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now, we're going to look closely at the wives part of this first, and then we'll pick on the husbands a bit, okay? And perhaps the most important thing I'm going to say today is simply this. Notice who the command is given to. Is the command given to men? No. The command is given to women. The command is given to wives. Nowhere is a command given to men to get their wives to submit, nor to use their position in the family as a club or command or form of control. Indeed, the minute a Christian husband accuses his Christian wife of not being submissive enough, he's just violated the command to love his wife as Christ loved the church. And second, notice here that Paul does not spell out the form that this submission should take place. We assume, wrongly, that submission looks a certain way. That it takes on particular roles. Wife as cook and housekeeper, mother and maid. How many of you remember June Cleaver? <laughs> Leave it to Beaver. Okay, you remember that? You almost expected that poor woman to show up at the front door with the slippers in her mouth. <laughs> Did you? You know, when Ward came home. But Paul doesn't spell it out, does he? What submission looks like for a Christian wife. Perhaps that is because God knew that roles and relationships change through the years. But the institution of marriage, God's idea of family, the necessity of structure and order in a family system, these things do not change. Remember Rosie the Riveter? Okay. There's a beautiful Veterans Day analogy there, isn't there? During World War II, thousands of women served our nation, not by taking up arms, but by taking up their own arms, working in armament and munition factories, supplying the American war effort. And this, while their husbands were off to war, and then these women went home to cook and clean and take care of their kids. So what does submission really mean? If it doesn't mean servitude, if it doesn't mean passivity, Perhaps another word can take its place. In fact, it's a parallel word that Paul uses in this text later on. It is simply the word respect. Wives, respect your own husbands as to the Lord. For what most men need most out of marriage is that feeling of respect. A feeling that way too many men do not feel in the workplace, in our culture today. Okay, men, now it's your turn. Brace yourselves because you thought you had it easy. You actually have the hardest part. Ephesians 5, 28 through 30. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes 
and cherish, cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. So what really is harder to do? Respect or love? And not just love because she is lovely. Not just love because you are romantically attracted. Not just love. Well, yes, men, we all know that love comes with benefits, right? No. That's not the type of love that's being talked about here. Indeed, the love here is that agape kind of love we talked about a few weeks ago. A godly kind of love. A self-sacrificing kind of love. A self-denying kind of love. A love that puts others first. Indeed, a love that loves the other more than it loves self. It's a Christ-like kind of love. The way Christ loves the church. The way Christ loves you and me. Husbands, men, we are called by the Apostle Paul to love our wives the way that Christ has loved us. Even, I might add, if that means laying down our life for our wife. <laughs> and what happens in a marriage when the husband demonstrates that type of sacrificial, self-giving, self-denying love? And what happens in a marriage when the wife demonstrates a respectful, honoring, loving type of love? Well, here it is. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. Folks, it ends up being a very beautiful thing. Wives submit, meaning wives respect, even when, perhaps especially when, you're having a hard time finding anything to respect about your husband. And men love sacrificially, meaning love until it hurts. Give not just a little, give yourself. Because see your wife for what she truly is. She's one of your ribs, your own flesh, your counterpart, your complement, the part of you, men, that you are missing. Which I believe is why Paul takes it right back to the beginning. The very beginning, the first marriage. Ephesians 5, 31 through 33. Therefore... A man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Rooted in loving submission. In Jesus' name.